No problem. Hello, my name is Harry Alvers. Uh, welcome to the Redwood uh, Empire CE program. Um, I've been lecturing since 1978, which I guess that means I've been doing this for 42 years. And uh, basically, I've prepared about 100 lectures over that time, uh, most of which um, I still have active. It was hard for me to decide what to talk about today, um, so I just tried to pick three subjects. Um, that I think that are the most commonly uh, perhaps misunderstood areas of dentistry that you do every single day. So I'm hoping that uh, you'll learn a lot at this particular point. Um, if you have any questions, you can email me. You can see my email address in the lower uh, left corner there. Um, we are taking questions during the program, so you can send those in, and I'll try to answer them. Um, and then uh, hopefully everybody will enjoy the, the program. Uh, so I decided I'd start out with tooth whitening um, and uh, dental adhesives and direct restoratives. Each of these programs is yeah, 45 minutes to about each and we should be done in about two hours. Any questions would be great. So good to be here with everybody. So today's first subject is going to be clinical aspects of tooth whitening. Uh, and I've just picked up things that I think that um, you'll find useful. Tooth whitening is something we do every day and take for granted, um, but at least from my observation of the community, um, things aren't quite um, uh, as uh, you know, consistent as everybody would like. So basically, um, I want to start out by saying I have no conflicts of any kind. I don't accept any money from any manufacturers. I don't uh, have them do anything for me financially or any otherwise. So everything here is, is just strictly um, uh, my personal opinion from my years of research. I do have a textbook. It's in its 10th edition. Uh, and uh, it's available for free. Uh, if you'd like to have it, you can uh, contact the Dental Society or, or email me directly. I have actually two books, Tooth Clutter Restorative in its 10th edition, which covers almost everything. There's no bleaching in there, but pretty much everything else. Um, and then I do have a, an old newsletter on bleaching if you want to know the science behind it. Uh, and another book called Impressions, which I've, uh, is now in its uh, second or third edition, and I can get you copies of that if you like. So at this point, um, hopefully everybody will uh, be able to get the information they want. So in terms of tooth whitening, I wanted to let you know that there is about 90% of people in the country, the dentists, do uh, home bleaching. Uh, it's simple, non-invasive. Uh, and patients tend to get extra work done once they've had their teeth bleach. Uh, typically in my office, we would start with um, an evaluation and we ask them always, do you like the color of your teeth? Uh, many patients say no. We always start with bleaching if there are no open lesions. And then after we do the bleaching and have the color they like, that opens up a whole lot of extra restorative work um, that they may want to have done. We let them know ahead of time that you know if the teeth are lighter, um, you may want to have other things done to match. So we, we try to do this as, as, as best as we can. Um, cause of discoloration are you know, genetics, medications, fever, age, trauma, uh, superficial stains, coffee, tea, and smoking. And you know, we'll try to deal with those as we move through. So I want to talk first about chemistry. Um, the chemistry of bleaching is very important to understand. You need to have a really basic understanding of what it can do and not do to get the ideal results. Uh, consistently. So pretty much the active ingredients must be mild, compatible, safe, pleasant, non-toxic, non-allergenic, and there aren't many P products that will do that. The only material presently used to actually lighten teeth in the world that's used consistently, uh, permanently lighten them, is hydrogen peroxide or carbamide peroxide, which are very similar uh, materials. One's a derivative of the other. So carbamide peroxide is pretty much what you're going to use in most of the bleaching products. Um, it has fewer side effects. 
it's more stable than hydrogen peroxide, even so, even though you can use both. Uh, usually 10% carbon peroxide results in about 3.6% of hydrogen peroxide over time. Uh, and the carbon peroxide contains carbopole, which is a very slow releasing um, way to let the bleach come out over a long period of time, um, rather than overwhelm the tissues right away. It's very thick, so it stays in the tray, and most of the products you're using will have varying amounts of that in it. So carbamide peroxide is a very special material because it is basically um, hydrogen peroxide bond to urea. And urea is bacteriocidal, uh, and it basically um, does a lot to improve gum health, and it does a lot to uh, slowly allow the bleach to be released over time. And so it breaks down into hydrogen peroxide and water. So your byproducts are water and um, oxygen. So the process of having the peroxide, which is released from the carbamide peroxide on the teeth, results in oxidation of the teeth and even the surrounding tissues. What oxidation is, is a slow burn. You're basically taking uh, molecules which are larger and larger molecules light bounces in them longer, and larger molecules are darker in color. If you break the molecules down into smaller molecules, they're lighter. The difference between dark pigments and light pigments in clothes is the length of the molecule. That's the main, main criteria. Um, so you need to understand that you know, you're actually breaking down molecules in the teeth when you're bleaching. So what happens is you start with a dark teeth. If you looked at a microscope, you see all these long, long molecules in there. And then what happens is you put the bleach on for a while, and the teeth get a little bit lighter, which is good. And then you put them on longer, and they get even more whiter. They get you know, kind of completely white. So there's a level which the bleaching is effective, because the, ble uh, the bleach attacks the weakest, easiest molecules first. And those are generally the inherent stains. But if you bleach too long, what happens is you start breaking the actual enamel matrix down and the dentin matrix. And what, if you do bleach long enough, you actually will remove a uh, protein that's keeping the tooth intact. Now, in a healthy tooth, the pulp will bring intercellular fluid up, I mean, cellular flu uh, pulp will fluid up into the tooth, and you can have that slowly reversed. The younger you are, the better you are. But there's sort of a limit to what bleaching can do, and it's important that you stay uh, within the confines of uh, you know, working, with, working with the material. A good analogy would be if you have a, a, uh, a t-shirt. You have a dirty t-shirt, and you put the dirty t-shirt inside the uh, wash machine. You put in some bleach, and it turns whiter. Put in some more bleach, and it's really very white. If you keep bleaching it, it comes out real thin. If you bleach it after it's really thin, you look in the wash machine, it's gone. There's nothing there. So basically, the bleach could eventually destroy everything that exists that's of a carbon material. So it's important that you understand those limitations. So the bleaching plant's pretty simple. Um, the carbonide peroxide is broken down to hydrogen peroxide. It uh, goes through the enamel. The enamel is a clear piece of glass. There's very little stain in the enamel. There could be some on the surface, but there's very little in the enamel. Almost all of the darkening of a tooth is in the dentin. So the peroxide wants to go through the enamel and into the dentin. Once it's in the dentin, it will break down large, usually ring-structured molecules. And those molecules are orange, brown, and yellow. The very large molecules are brown. The medium-sized molecules are orange. And the ones that break pretty easy are yellow. So these are substances that get broken down in the dentin. And the dentin basically is where the color is of the tooth. And the, basically, the enamel is like a clear glass coating, like a window covering the dentin underneath. So then the smaller molecules lighten, and that's what you get is a lightened tooth. So the important thing to remember is orange yellow is removed. So you basically can see from the picture on the left that the teeth on the right and left look similar, except the yellow has been taken out. However, there are a lot of pigments that aren't taken out, and those are the ones that have a metal oxide component. And those are generally gray stains. Gray stains generally are not organic molecules. They could be, but it's very rare. They're usually pigments, uh, you know, iron, um, 
any other pigment. Uh, it could be uh, uh, various inorganic components. And those inorganic well, components usually don't bleach well. So if you look at a tooth and there's like a little orange, a little brown, a little gray, and a little blue, you should imagine, if you could have the computer in front of you, you can remove some of the pigments. What you're going to get left with is just the gray and the blue and the yellow and orange will be gone. So you can almost, with a little skill, figure out what the tooth's going to look like after it's done. So for example, the most common color uh, that a tooth will bleach to is easy an A2 or maybe an A1. You don't want to go much lighter than that. If the tooth starts out relatively gray colored, you generally end up with, at best, a C2. That's most common. Important to understand. So the initial whitening, again, is uh, is, 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 it takes a while to bleach a tooth, but the very initial whitening is usually from oxygen bubbles, because when you, the reaction occurs and you go from the carbamide peroxide to the hydrogen peroxide, and that reacts with the tooth, what's released in the reaction is oxygen bubbles, millions of little teeny bubbles. And those bubbles give an immediate whitening. And that's one of the reasons that you know, uh, in-office whitening looks so impressive, because the day you put it in, they look really white. But most of that white is not real lightning. It's, it's artifact, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, and so the lightning takes longer. So the bubbles that are in the tooth that blow up, they basically the peroxide goes in, reacts with the, with the dentin, and then all of a sudden you get or the stains in the dentin, and all of a sudden you get little teeny bubbles. It basically results in a reflection of light. So you get this reflective surface that comes underneath. So if you look at a tray carefully after you put the bleach in, usually, you know, like not that long afterwards, you can see little bubbles in the tray, usually. If you look carefully, you'll see them. Especially with your magnifier, you'll be able to see them. And that means that the active bleach is, is working. That particularly occurs uh, when you first bleach for the first time. But you have to understand the initial whitening is not whitening. It is, the tooth looks white, I agree, but the actual tooth's not lighter. So a good example is a soda bottle. A soda bottle has in a CO2 gas. So the CO2 gas is not unlike your bleaching material before you use it. Once you open the soda bottle, and if you shake it a little bit, you get all types of bubbles. That's like taking the bleach and having it react with the tooth. The liquid hydrogen peroxide turns into bubbles. If you ever pour hydrogen peroxide into any, any dish with something in it, you'll see the bubbles right away. The trouble with those bubbles is they're short term. They purr in the tooth, wow, it looks white, and then they slowly work themselves out on the surface. So over a short period of time, usually a day or two, the bubbles start going away, and then eventually you have nothing. So if you do like a rapid bleach with a lot of power at front, what you're looking at is a second picture. You're looking basically at a whole bunch of foam. And three days later, it's a lot darker. And that's why people that do in-office bleaching, which I don't recommend, if you don't give them a home tray to take with you, then after three days later, they're going to be pretty unhappy campers. So it's a pretty understand the difference between the lightning of the tooth and the oxygen gas, which is released everywhere, that makes the tooth look artificially light. So bleaching is time concentration dependent. That means any amount of bleach used over a different amount of times will give the exact same amount of whitening. So it's very important to understand that. Because if you uh, don't, uh, you may you know, end up using concentrations that will have serious effects on, on the tissues. Because there's no reason to think that a higher concentration will improve things. So what happens with bleaching, and I like using a low, low dose over time, is that as you keep bleaching, you get to a point where no more lightning occurs. And then the tooth starts losing a pigment. And then if you lost all the pigment, let's say you got an A1, and now it's looking like a B1. And then you got a young woman there that wants it really whiter, or a young guy wants it really whiter. If you push it and you keep having them bleach, the teeth will start appearing blue because you're going to not have any pigment in there, and the light's going to want to go all the way through. And you get some scattering from the enamel, and the effect is basically blue edges on the teeth, which the may go away after a period of time, but sometimes it, it, it never comes back quite the way it was. So when you get break down the dentin matrix, you basically get you know, weakening of the tooth and damage that is not really necessary. So the safest way to apply 
any type of leach is slow over a long period of time. You basically want to take a small amount of leach and give it a, a chance to easily go through the enamel and into the dentin. The weaker the bleach, the more easily it will get into the dentin without causing discomfort. And we'll talk about that in a second because high concentrations don't improve the end result, but you can have a lot of serious uh, patient uh, complications. So basically home bleaching is, again, time concentration dependent. So we, we generally uh, we like to use 10% carbamide peroxide. You can use it higher, but 10 is the safest. It takes two weeks to six months to bleach, up to a year if you have tetracycline, because that's gray. Uh, there are some studies that over time, the tetracycline, uh, it's not really metal, but it's a molecule that doesn't break down easily. And you can uh, get it improved over long periods of time, but I, I don't recommend that. Generally, you want to bleach for like 30 minutes a day. An hour is fine. Uh, you can also put it in at night. Uh, that's fine, because after about 30 minutes, 90% of the efficiency is gone. You get more after the next half hour, but uh, I have many patients just wear it at night to bed because it's just um, a lot easier. And the urea stays in there for a little while too, which actually when you, you'll notice the gums look really healthy uh, you know, after they've been wearing the trays. And then usually you get two shades lighter. Two shades you can, you can count on pretty regularly if the patient is, is a normal uh, clinical situation. Three shades is pushing it. Um, you can do it, but it's um, harder. And uh, four shades, uh, I would think twice. You can try it, but generally, if you're gonna, don't promise them that. You know, if they're an A4 and they want to be a B1, I wouldn't promise them that. Uh, I'd show them an A2 shade tab, an A3 shade, shade tab, and say, you're probably gonna end up with somewhere between this. It might look whiter when they first put the trays in because of the bubbles, but the long-term result won't be that different. So most studies show that with 10%, 90% of the patients get 90% of the results in about um, six weeks. So basically, I like people to use it um, very lightly for about, um, until we get the desired result. If we don't get the desired result, I'll just have them keep doing it. But at three weeks, that's when I say, you know, we're going to stop. Because at that point, uh, going much further, unless they have tetracycline, or something like that, you're not gonna get, get a lot. So basically, you typically have a tooth which is yellow, as you see in the upper left, and it turns out being lighter, uh, usually a typical A3, A4, down to an A1, A2. That's kind of your safest changes. Uh, usually, if you look closely at the teeth, even after a short period, you'll see the yellow is removed. Not much else, but the yellow is removed the most. Uh, and some changes are subtle. So if they come in with pretty light teeth, you know, if they come in with an A1 or an A2 and they want to be lighter, eh, you may not see much. The bubbles will show. The pictures I'm showing you have the afterwards of those taken six weeks after. So the bubbles are long gone. Generally, the bubbles can hang around uh, and the tissue could be, uh, the enamel could be affected by up to two weeks. So there's a difference between bleachers and brighteners. Now, a brightener is something that you generally put in a toothpaste that if you brush with it, it makes your teeth look really white. It's used a lot in um, detergents and, and fabric softeners. So basically what you have is it's, a, it's organic things basically become yellow over, so a t-shirt that's white could become yellow over time. So what the companies do that make these whitening detergents put in them these molecules and these molecules what they do is they change the reflected light from UV light. You can take energy at a high amount of energy and drop it, which is a lower color. So UV you can't see, but if you drop the energy, you can turn it into blue light. You can't go the other way without putting in energy, but you can easily do this in, as a chemical. And then basically, when, if you're outside and you're exposed to sun, sunlight, you'll see uh, the teeth look whiter. So what that is, basically, is the bleaching actually lightens the tooth uh, by breaking the molecules into smaller molecules. But the brighteners, they're quite different. They lay on the surface, and when that UV light hits them, they reflect blue light, or basically uh, a lighter shade of light that makes the teeth look white. So you put this stuff on your teeth, you brush with it, a little bit of it stays on the surface, it doesn't take much, 
and then that looks whiter. So a brightener is something that's often in a lot of the over-the-counter products that people use, and they'll often say, gee, it looks great, um, but they're short-term. Uh, you know, a day later when the product is gone, you won't see any effect. But you need to understand they exist uh, because they're um, used in a lot of products. So the method of application, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, you can do home bleaching, which is what I recommend. That's the, the best way to apply bleach over time, slowly over time. There's office bleaching, which I don't recommend, but it's a real marketing tool. Uh, people charge a lot of money. I've had patients come in my office. And they say, oh, it was so painful. It was just so painful. And they did this for an hour, and there's this big light on there, and it really hurt bad. But they were so white when I left. And they were even white the next day. But a week later, all the whiteness went away. And they're really upset. And so they call the office, and they say, oh, come back for another $750. We'll do it again. Uh, well, that's someone who doesn't really understand what's going on. So basically, uh, I could see doing an office bleaching if they're going to a party that night or the next day. But after that, I highly recommend uh, staying away from that. Denifrices work fine. Um, if you get one with whiteners in it, the brighteners in it, they'll look really good. Uh, you want to brush, if you're getting photos taken or something, you want to brush it you know, half an hour before you have the photos, you'll look good on the photos because the light will come back pretty bright. But the next day, uh, the result will be minimal. And then white strips. White strips have hydrogen peroxide in them with a compound, not the carbapol, but another compound because of patents. And they work quite, quite well. They work quite well. Put them on the front teeth. Um, if you, uh, the problem with them is you don't, you get a lot of surface stain removal. So if they're coffee drinkers, you get surface stain. But to get the color to go inside the tooth from one side, uh, you can do it, but they, they can be slow. Uh, they look really good the, when you first use them. So if they go from stains to a lighter color, uh, they'll work in a couple days. Um, but for long-term bleaching that lasts a long time, uh, bathing the teeth in a low concentration solution with a tray is by far superior. Over-the-counter is really something. They have these boil and bite box. I've seen a lot of people uh, go over the counter because the cost is low and end up swallowing lots of bleach. I've had people come in with you know, kind of sore throats from uh, swallowing the stuff. Um, I'm okay with over-the-counter, but the trouble is there's no dental exam. Um, and I explain to people that the, at the price that we give people the bleach, it's less than over-the-counter. We, we charge our, our costs. We just charge to make the tray. And we try to explain to the person the tray is very important. Not only is it useful for bleach, but if you have sensitivity, we can, put, uh, we can give you uh, desensitizing agents like fluoride to put in the tray to make it quite better. We use the bleaching tray mostly because we have control. If they get sensitivity later during the treatment, we can easily have them switch out you know, f fluoride uh, every other time or every third time to control any sensitivity issues. This is really important with the younger patients that have large pulps where uh, if you push it, they can really have some discomfort. So basically, 6% hydrogen peroxide 30 minutes a day is usually how the white strips tend to work. So home bleaching, again, the most safe and effective way for treatment. Uh, best indications for home bleaching, uh, again, yellow, orange, brown stains. Um, basically, you stay away from the dark uh, blue-gray stains. You can do it. But stains of smoking coffee and tea, those things come out really quick. So we have some patients that smoke a lot. Uh, some of them use recreational uh, smoking. And they get really heavy stains in the front teeth. And uh, uh, for that type of thing, you don't need to really bleach for six weeks. You just put the bleach in the tray, and the next morning, it's gone. So that's a whole different idea. If you can't send them, brush the stuff off, and it's in these deep pores of the teeth, uh, it's quite OK to, to use it seasonally. But I usually don't like patients only to bleach uh, under my instruction. But that's something that uh, might be unique and work out. Contracations, pregnant women, immersing mothers. Uh, peroxide is a carcinogen. Uh, if you mix it with someone with a tumor in their mouth, let's say somebody has in inner oral lesions, the chances of those inner oral lesions becoming malignant go up exponentially in the presence of peroxide. Peroxide breaks molecules. DNA that's struggling in a, in a precancerous cell will get a big boost from uh, any type of free radical which comes from peroxide. So uh, no pregnant people, nobody that's nursing, no children under 12, heavy smokers. Um, the research shows that heavy smokers are more likely to get mouth cancer. And mouth cancer grows faster if you bleach. So I would explain to patients in my office, I say, you know, 
while you're bleaching, I'd prefer you not smoke at all. Because, and I explained to them, is any, the cancerous components of the tobacco are exponentially increased with the presence of the bleaching material. High alcohol consumption, that's an iffy. Um, there's, there's some research shows that if you're, if you're an alcoholic, uh, the bleach doesn't help much, but uh, that's less hard-nosed. And then recession, a lot of exposed teeth with sensitivity, the bleaching will affect those. If they have a lot of sensitivity, but they don't need any restorations, generally what I will do is, uh, in their mouth, I'll generally uh, uh, either restore the restorations first in the ideal color, or the target color, where we're going to end, or I'll basically end up putting them on fluoride for a while if they don't need to be restored until their sensitivity is low enough to do the bleaching. And then, of course, any oral lesions, uh, get a biopsy before you do that. Reversible side effects, tooth sensitivity, soft tissue irritation, soreness of the throat. Uh, these are to be expected. Um, I'm going to go really just briefly, mostly for the assistants and the staff here and how to get this going. First appointment, your initial consultation. Next, you review the procedure with the patient and provide them the material. And then you want to have a follow-up. Pretty important. On the first consultation, yes, you can explain everything to them, but you'll want to take a photo. If you don't take a photo with a shade type in it, I've a lot of dentists get in trouble because the patient said the bleach didn't work. Their records show it got three shades lighter, but in their eyes it looks the same. So the photo is very important. Uh, to do dentistry without documentation in, in this day and age is, is considered below the standard of care. So you want a photo with a shade tab in it. Explain the initial limitations, explain the side effects, um, take your trays for the fabrication. Uh, you know, some people recommend a cleaning before, I sure do. At least not, you know, you want to get rid of anything on the surface that could be a problem. Next, what you do is you dispense the material and you evaluate the fit of the tray, review the technique, and go over uh, the possible side effects again. Tissue irritation, tooth sensitivity, explain to them that putting more bleach is not good. Usually one drop of bleach per tooth is plenty, otherwise I'm swallowing it. But usually I go over the hours and the days and stuff like that. When you give them a bleach, you want to buy the thickest one possible with the lowest concentration. Uh, generally, we in our office use 10%. Some companies have stopped making 10, and then now give us 15. 15 works on most people in their 30s and older. Those are the high bleaching population in the, in the 20s and young patients, even though they shouldn't need to be bleached. Um, you know, 10 is the best. Uh, it will take a little bit longer to get the teeth whiter, but you'll have less tissue problems, and you'll get a deeper. The, the weaker the bleach, the further it goes in the tooth. Um, the stronger materials react quickly on the surface. And uh, some studies show that you get, a, you get, you don't get it, the bleaching doesn't last as many months afterwards. So that's kind of the consensus. You want to make your custom tray. You want a soft, flexible material. You want to make sure the tray is trimmed. And uh, basically, I like to have it finished onto the gums about one millimeter to give you a seal. Because one of the biggest problems with bleaching is people swallow too much bleach. And the 10% will not irritate the gums at all. In fact, they'll do just great with it. And so you might as well get a good seal, particularly if they are older and there's the pillows exposed everywhere. Over tray, it doesn't go to the gums. They're just going to have swallowing it in the first 20 minutes and the saliva's going to wash it out. So you want to be aware of that. And I've had people coming to me with failing bleaching, bleaching uh, uh, experience, and I, I get their tray, and it's trimmed onto the enamel only, and they've got these huge spaces between their teeth, and there's holes under the tray, and so those don't work quite as well. Do not use reservoirs. Um, they don't do anything at all, and in fact, they just result in more use of bleach in a flimsier fitting tray. Take extra time. They don't improve the lightning at all. So basically, you want to trim everything, millimeter past the tissues, you want to round all the sharp edges. And then you want to basically see them periodically. Um, some people, what they'll do is if you know the constant, some people don't, don't, aren't compliant. So you're not going to do it every night or whatever you say. So I know that there's a certain amount of bleach in each tube. So I give them a set amount of tubes. I tell them to do it you know, three minutes a day or at night. And when the tubes are gone, I want to see you for another appointment. I say that should be about two weeks. If it's earlier or longer, you can, you can change your appointment. Um, and the, tr the trick is if they call up and say they're out of bleach in five days, they end up swallowing stuff. 
So basically, you want one drop. And you don't even need it in all the teeth. You need it on the teeth from first premolar to first premolar. Because when you put the tray in, if you seat it from front to back slowly, it will cover everything. So those instructions are really important. And then you put the, you know, the shade in the patient's chart and kind of go from there. So provide instructions, typical patient, you know, brush and flush your teeth, insert the tray. It's important to insert the tray slowly from front to back and the tray bleach will be in the front. What's going to happen in most trays, you'll still get expiration going out the second molar when you put one drop in between uh, the first premolar molar and the first premolar. Uh, encourage them to brush first. That's a good idea. Get rid of food debris. And then fill the tray again, one drop in each, which is about a quarter full. Then you have them slowly put the tray in again from front to back. And then you leave it for 30 minutes or overnight. And then you want to remove it slowly. It doesn't matter how you remove it. But you don't want to brush after they remove it because the studies show the enamel is soft after the acidic, all the bleaches are acidic, that the enamel rods are, it's like a net surface, a micro etched surface. If you brush afterwards, the studies show you get, uh, it, you get a lot of tooth loss. So you don't want to brush your teeth for at least an hour after you go ahead and um, take out the tray. Um, the teeth are very brittle at that time. They've got the, uh, some of the uh, enamel rods are exposed. The protein is still there. We're, we're, we're remineralizing 24 hours, or at least in a few hours, if you don't end up you know, brushing it off. Then you want to rinse the tray out. Just rinse the tray out and then store it dry. It shouldn't have any discoloration in it. So the treatment options, 30 minutes uh, a day, if you want to go twice a day, you can, uh, if the patient can tolerate it, even though I, I find if they're impatient, you can do that. It will go a little bit faster, but not necessarily that much better. If you can do it twice a day, they need to be spread out as far as possible. Nighttime wearing, I think, is, is easiest for most people. They brush their teeth anyway at night, usually, and they put the tray in there and take it out in the morning. That works. And then um, if you have severe cases of tetracycline, um, some people go, you know, they really push it hard. I done a fair number of those in my, in my career, and some patients can tolerate it, some can. And I have gotten some improved results. The idea is to avoid doing restorative. So again, there's a fixed amount of whitening in each tube. Uh, the slower over the longer period of time, the better it's going to be. Um, more bleach will just, a lot of inclination, people want to go faster. The biggest problem I see is people putting in too much bleach. So we show them, and if they come back, you know, earlier than the bleach should have been used up, uh, we go over that again. And then the edges of the tooth will always whiten first because the edges are the thinnest. And so the teeth bleach from the incisal edge to the gingiva. The last thing to bleach is the gingival one third. So people come in after bleaching for a while and they go, gee, you know, the bottoms are really white, but there's nothing on the top. So I need to explain to them, the top, there's a lot more dentin. The enamel is not doing much. It's just clear window glass. And so that's going to go much slower. So generally, the first two weeks, you'll get a lot of whitening to the middle third. And it's the last four weeks where you go from the middle third up to the gingival line. And not all patients will do as well as others in that gingival one third. That's the toughest place to match. So let's talk about sensitivity, a real issue. And I want to talk about uh, the things you need to know about that. So your biggest problem with bleaching in your office is sensitivity. And it's a real problem. So these are the facts on sensitivity with home bleaching. 70% of the patients have some sensitivity. So you just should tell them up front, you're going to have sensitive teeth. You just, just, that way, you'll, you know, you'll have overestimated you know, their experience you know, for 30%. But yeah, just tell them. 70% will have sensitivity. Half the people have moderate sensitivity. So it's really uncomfortable. So you want to have them expect that up front. That's why we start with low concentration. You can go up, but you just, once you have bad experiences, it doesn't look good to go down. 25% of the patients in multiple studies have sensitivity with a placebo gel. The placebo gel is water with a thickener. 25% report sensitivity, which means they basically have sensitivity from just wearing a tray. That's a problem. Uh, so that's important to know. 
15% will have problems with an empty tray. So 25% placebo gel, so you put the same tray in with just an empty tray and 15% have problems. So there's a 10% placebo effect in there. And the most important thing to know is that those with a history of tooth sensitivity prior to bleaching will have the most sensitivity. So the first thing I ask when someone wants to bleach is I say, have you ever had sensitive teeth before? That's the big question. And if they say no, I feel pretty good. If they say sometimes or a lot, that's a red flag. And with those people, if I'm going to bleach them, I will start them out with fluoride uh, two nights and one with bleach and then fade them in until they're comfortable rather than having a bad experience, uh, which is hard to recover from. So the causes of pain are generally C fiber pain. Those A fibers, which are basically means the pulp's dying. That's that dull lake that comes and goes. That's endodontic referral. Um, the C fiber pain is sharp, intense pain that's sporadic. And that's from the dentin tubules usually being stretched out of the um, odontoglass. And that's a real, a real issue. And you want to avoid that. And it occurs from hypertonic solutions. And all bleaching materials are hypertonic. In other words, they draw in water. So when you put them on the tooth, they draw in water. If those tubules are open or have dead tracks, the water is going to go from the tooth into the bleaching solution to dilute it down. And they're going to have pain. So typical sensitivity problems. Um, most patients have transient uh, temperature to cold. Their gums could be irritated sometimes. Um, and they can cure together. Uncontrollable situations of peroxide going into the tooth. That's your rare patient. Almost all of those have sensitivity before you start. Um, extreme large pulp, you look at the x-ray. With the younger patients, exposed root surfaces if they're sensitive. And severe loss of enamel on the tooth. Those are uncontrollable causes you need to deal with. Controllable, the tray fitting, overfilling the tray, changing the, the bleach in less than 24 hours, you know, basically um, using a softer, more comfortable material. Treatment sensitivity, what you can use is the, if you want, active treatment, you can give me sensitizing toothpaste if you want. Fluoride in the tray, I think, is the best. That's what I use. There's lots of them on the market. Um, any neutral fluoride. It's got to be neutral, and you want as high a concentration as you can get. Uh, if you want to use potassium nitrate, you can. Potassium nitrate is a desensitizer. Uh, some bleaching products in the market say the desensitizer is added in. That, those contain potassium nitrate, which is an inorganic salt, which does reduce um, sensitivity on some patients. But I generally uh, don't like doing that because it, it will um, block it, it doesn't fill in the tubules, so I'd rather have the fluoride be there and have a more permanent fix. Uh, Pass or treatment, reduce the wearing time every other day, every third day. Um, reduce the frequency of application, um, and the concentration should, ideally should be low at 10. Risk benefits, you have cold sensitivity, C fiber pain, the sharp shooting pain, which is very hard to handle. A fiber pain is very rare, that means pulp death, that's the dull ache that comes and goes. Porosity of the, of the surfaces of the teeth, uh, usually when the tray is removed. If you're careful with that, that should be fine. Um, if you really have a lot of sensitivity, you can always have them put the tray in for an hour and then have them put fluoride in for another hour afterwards, you know, immediately. That's also possible. And then, of course, you have the contrast to the other restorations. All their teeth are A3 or A4. Their crowns are A3, A4. You do the bleaching, they're all A2. Uh, they become unhappy. So, of course, that's discussed up front. The safety of bleaching, very, very safe uh, if under guidelines. And the data basically shows that um, the, you know, the under area of the enamel is not softened, but the outer area is etched. So basically, the evidence shows that 10% carbonate peroxide used for up to 21 days um, uh, can result in severe enamel loss um, if you overdo it. So the idea is enamel wear can increase. Um, if you push it. So if you do it at night, um, in, the, in the morning when the patient gets up, there's, you have the minimum amount of loss. So when in doubt, uh, the studies show that since 14 days, if you do it continually, is the benchmark, many people recommend pause after two weeks. Go for two weeks, 
give them two weeks worth, wait a week, then do it again. The advantage of doing that is the bubbles will be gone two weeks after they do the two weeks, and then you'll have the real color because you don't want to make any decisions based on oxygen bubbles floating in the teeth. So the two-week pause is considered uh, safer than just going straight for six weeks. Effects of materials, none of the composites uh, change with the uh, bleaching materials. Uh, ceramic restorations, no effect. However, temporary materials are a real problem. If you're making your typical methylmethacrylate temporaries, they will turn to orange. Not good. Uh, Polycarboxylate crowns are okay, and the bis bisacryl temporary materials uh, are okay with it. So basically, uh, bond strengths can be decreased. Uh, for about two weeks, so you don't want to bleach and then bond right away. So you want to bleach the teeth, wait two weeks to get the right color, and then if you want, you can do restorative. You don't want to bleach and then do restorations basically the same day or soon afterwards because the oxygen bubbles stay in the tooth for up to two weeks, and the oxygen will prevent any polymer from polymerizing. Peroxide inhibits polymerization of resins. It polymerizes your, bond, your bonding agent from sticking to the tooth. Uh, particularly den bonding agents. So uh, one way to get failures is to bleach the teeth like crazy, and then all of a sudden you're looking at the tooth, so it looks like an A1. It's not really an A1, it's an A2, but you got the bubbles there. Then you put restorations in that day, uh, and then you know two weeks later the teeth drop another shade, the restorations look white, and then because you bonded to a bubbly surface uh, with oxygen in it, the bond starts failing. I've seen some serious issues, and you basically want to stay away from those. So when you're dealing with bleaching, don't rush, don't rush, don't rush. Longevity, how long does bleaching last? Typically three to five years if it's done slowly over time. What does that mean? That means that if you start out with an A4, to get back to an A4 takes three to five years. Now, the bottom line is usually what happens is you bleach, and two years later, um, they're going to actually, you, you don't really gain ground because technically a better analogy would be if you went to an A1 to an A3. So in five years, they'd be naturally an A4. But they'll go back to the A3. So the, you, know, you do gain the aging period over that time, which is time where it's picking up pigment. But basically, I tell people three to five years, and I tell them it's going to look white to you for two years, usually, if you do it properly. People who come in at six months and say they're dark again are usually people that one an A1 or an A or a B1, and it's not sustainable. So I tell them, you know, this is the lightness that you can get out of your teeth with just whitening. And so I try to get people to accept an A2 before I start. I'd say you might get to this color, but let's start with an A2. And I tend to uh, uh, feel that, my, from my experience, there's a certain part of people's lives that they really want to bleach, and then five years later. You know, their shade, their shade dropped down. And I said, would you like to bleach again? They often say no. So, you know, I want to have the restorations at a color where they're not going to stick out really bad should they allow uh, not to be uh, re-bleached. So I generally, even if they bleach to an A1, I try to get the restorations not much lighter than an A2. So that's my wiser choice. So uh, the, how long the color changes depends on smoking, age, and oral hygiene. Smoking definitely will get them darker quickly. So an overview, overview of how bleaching works. It has a minimal effect on the enamel. It works by lightening the dentin. Breaks down dark yellow-orange stains, which are colored molecules. It's concentration and time dependent. And initial whitening uh, is oxygen bubbles. And be aware of that, because it lasts a while. Any questions on? That's basically my uh, mini, mini lecture on tooth whitening. And hopefully, you've learned a few things on that. And then I was going to go from this lecture, if there aren't any questions coming in, to my next lecture, which would be on dent bonding. So I'll just switch my computer over here real quickly. Let's see, it takes a couple of minutes. So in our office, we price bleaching very modestly. We want it to be an inexpensive thing. We try to charge about the cost to do the service, which is around $400. Um, because we make our money not on the bleaching, but on all that work that comes with it after they bleach. Almost all of those patients end up having more work done later. 
and it takes so little time for us to make the trays and go over with them, that's a goodwill thing. And it does bring in a lot of new patients. People come in and they basically um, are real happy um, that they had the bleaching done, and we get referrals. So I think that's a consideration. Trying to make a killing on bleaching, I would say, is probably not your best business model. So the reason I put that lecture first, it had some stuff for the, it's a little lighter, it had some stuff for the assistants. Um, I now want to go into probably the most important area, which is bonding. And I've been practicing in this community since 1978. And I get a lot of patients that come in the office over the years. And if I had to point my thing at one thing, which I see from patients coming in to my office, the one thing I see of dentistry previously done which there are errors which are preventable. It is bonding failures. It's unbelievable. I have a whole, you know, thousands of patients. Uh, that's the thing I end up seeing the most of. And almost all of them, not all of them, but most of them are preventable. And that's because there's so much misinformation out there on dent and bonding. I just can't believe it. I mean, I go to lectures myself and I listen to that guy, you must, wow, you know, I mean, a lot of people just go up there and they just uh, say things. Um, there are really good courses on bonding um, that are available throughout the country, but usually dentists don't want to take the courses with a lot of science in them. I took all the chemicals out of this lecture to make it as simple as possible, but I kept all the essential content, and there's a half a dozen to a dozen things in here that if you just understand those things, your bonding failures will drop off to a few percent. Um, the average bonding failures in the country is in the 20s and 30s in terms of failure in five-year period, and most of those are preventable. So let's go through these and see if I can answer some questions. Now, there is a pointer here. I didn't use it earlier, and it's how this thing works. I push this button, and I go to pointer options. And I don't know if this is going to help much, but I'll use the red pointer on this one because there might be some places that I want to use it. So again, I have no conflict of interest. Most of the material, the basic material that I'm going to print you is all in this book, and it's free. And um, the book's won a number of awards. It's free to you. It's a tenth edition. Uh, you know, it's been around since the early 80s. Um, and the most recent edition was updated just a few years ago. So it's pretty current. But there are some new things I added in this lecture that just developed in the last couple of years. And I will probably do this book again for every five years is about what I feel is worth to, to publish it over. But so anyways, it's available to you for free. And so you don't have to take notes. It's all pretty much in here. If there's something really important, I'll say it more than once so that you can remember it. So um, most people had a really good basic science study in dental school. Some didn't. The um, basic science information on bonding materials is really variable throughout the country. And for people who went to dental school like me, uh, you know, 45 years ago, um, an update is always good. So I want to go through the various surfaces of bonding, and I just want to go through um, uh, basically what you really need to know. So the first thing is, uh, I like this quote, it's not what you do, but what you understand. If you understand bonding, if you have a gut feeling for how it works, it's easy to do, and you know exactly when it's important and when it's not, and that's what I want to give to you today. So the most important to think when you're bonding is kind of contact angle. When you do any bonding in the mouth, anything, every step is like a link in a chain. And every step needs a low contact angle. In other words, the material you're adding has to drop very thin on the material you're trying to bond to. If one of the steps has a high contact angle, that is you, your weak link in the chain. And you've got to watch what you're doing. Because many times, a material could be expired, since you're going to have the wrong bottle, all kinds of things can happen. But as soon as you see one of the procedures doesn't go flat, you want a red flag, and you start over. Um, so that's really important. The contact angle is everything, and I want to try to explain to you uh, that. So if you have the material bubble up, it's actually repulsive. It's like oil and water. You're going to get the opposite of bonding. So you pick up the wrong bottle or the wrong tube, that's what you're going to see. If the material lays you know, like 90 degrees from the surface, you have nothing. No repellent shit, no re not, doesn't repel, doesn't, nothing happens. So what you need to see every single time is a very low contact angle. That means that the material is actually penetrating into the surface. Without penetration, nothing happens. So in dentistry, everything has a high 
mechanical component, even chemical bonding. There's a large mechanical component. So I want to talk about if, you know, time, uh, five different bonding systems, the bonding to enamel, dentin, resin, porcelain, and metal. The most important one for sure is the enamel bonding, uh, I mean the dentin bonding, but I'm going to go over them all because it doesn't take a lot of time to review them. So enamel bonding is what most people do right, but there's still enamel bonding failures because people uh, use dentin bonding agents improperly on the enamel. So let's talk a little bit about that. So this is a normal enamel. You can see how it looks. It's got basically um, half micron rods in five micron bundles with a protein around it. That's what it looks like when you don't etch it. And it's very strong because the rods are sticking out at the end. So that's important to remember. And when, that's unetched there. If you etch it with an acid, usually 37% phosphoric acid, 15, 20 seconds, you remove the little crystals that are sticking out, and you have a mechanical surface which can be used to mechanically lock into the surface. Mechanical bonding in enamel is mostly how it works. You remove the inorganic phase. When you do that, you lose some of the surface. You don't want to etch more than you have to because every second that goes by, you're getting less and less tooth. That actually, especially if you, if you, if you uh, go back and, and you know, rub it back and forth on the surface. So you want to go 20 seconds. No reason to take off a lot of extra enamel if you don't need to. And so you have some something off the surface and you have holes. And those holes can be filled in with tags. And the tags that we use are something very fluid. They'll go into the tooth. And you can see right here the resin tags into the sur tooth surface with a surface. And every uh, resin that's added that's just thin has what's called air inhibition layer because air and peroxides will inhibit the material from polymerizing. So that air inhibition layer allows you to stick something to it. And this is the resin tags when they would dissolve. So enamel, when you're working with it, the first thing I should say is all enamel bonding works much better to a prepared surface, even if you just disc it. To bond anything to a tooth without disking, you're rarely going to have the enamel there. There's all kinds of junk on the surface. So every surface that you plan to bond a composite to should have at least be disked, you know, just you know, a few microns off the surface um, to have clean enamel. Um, there's different exits you can use in dentistry. Uh, straight on is the most conservative. This will give you the most cosmetic result. This will give you the strongest result, and this is the most conservative, usually used on occlusal for a preventive resin restoration. This is used on the lingual of a class four because it's not going to chip. This is used on a facial for aesthetics, and this is used to preserve a contact angle. That's pretty much how we do it. <coughs> no matter which one you use, uh, if you etch it, you'll have much less leakage, which is very important to know. And the other thing to know is that the surface is, has a high energy once you do it. It's very easily contaminated. And um, you then need to be very, very careful not to allow anything to get on the surface. The most common contaminant uh, on enamel is water. The second is um, intercellular fluid. So let me just go over a few things. Usually you want to rinse for at least 15 seconds. Otherwise, the actual etch crystal that you removed is laying on the surface. You want to remove it 15 seconds. And that removes the dissolved HF, uh, hydrogen, hydroxyapatite. And then, of course, uh, in, in, inadequate bonding, less than 15 seconds, you, you have less bonding agents. So this shows you the enamel bond strengths here. And this shows you the etched surfaces here. And you can see that uh, over about a very short period, less than three or four minutes, you have the strength of the enamel, which means that the, if you pull the bonded enamel apart, the tooth will break, uh, not the resin. Contaminants are important. Oil, water from the handpiece and saliva. Water is very common. You can easily dry that off. One of the biggest con contaminants, basically, is the, um, is the uh, oil from the handpiece. And so it's very important that um, you have the handpieces run for a fair amount of time prior to prepping a tooth. Um, and the second, uh, the one after that was saliva from the intercellular fluid. If you're doing a class five, the fluid keeps coming up from the surface. You can avoid that by just having a, um, uh, a cord in there to prevent the fluid. But uh, contaminants are a real uh, issue. So this shows you the etched surface. 
And that shows you saliva for one second. And the bond goes pretty close to zero. So no saliva, no intercircular fluid, and oil from the handpiece is a real serious issue. The handpiece you can often pick up because when you etch it, you see white everywhere. White, you want white frosty enamel, and there's little dark spots in it. That generally is oil. So if you get that, you start over, um, take a cotton pellet, rub the surface with um, some alcohol, rinse it off, etch again, and it should be gone. Don't put the handpiece back on it, and you should probably be okay. So educating the etch, etch solution, uh, many uh, studies show that's uh, useful if you're particularly on a, a surface which isn't smooth. Uh, for like an occlusal surface, you want to just agitate things a little bit. And that's pretty much it for the enamel bonding. Dent and resin bonding, let's go in a little bit into that. This is where we want to basically keep eyes on everything. Um, these are basically 25% organic with some mineral. And let me show you some of the issues with that. Dent's a living surface, and most of the biggest issues dentists have with dent and bonding, a lot of them are sensitivity. And the older the patient, the less you have. The younger the patient, the more you have. And the deeper you go, the more you have. Because as you go into the tooth, the tubules get wider and wider and wider. If you're really deep, you're better off putting a base in there, if you're, if it's, especially if it's pink, because um, sensitivity is common because most of the dentin bonding materials don't have perfect seals. So basically, deeper you go, the more likely you'll have problems. So, if the dentin is cut, if you have a tooth and it's cut, you get what's called a smear layer. So the dentin tubules get smeared over, and this is important to understand how the different dentin bonding agents will tend to work. So basically, the dentin smear layer um, varies. It varies a lot. Um, and so since it's so inconsistent, if you bond to it, you never really know what you get. So it's got more calcium. It's you know it does indu in induce or reduce tubular flow. So I'm going to talk about how the new materials handle this and don't handle it. So we want to you know work with this, and you need to understand how your dent bonding agent works in order to get the best use out of it. So dent bonding is used. It's done in a laboratory. You take a little composite and you put it on the side of a a, of a, a piece of dentin and you break it off like this. The problem is that's not how we use composites. We use composites differently. So we don't really, um, unless you're doing brackets, you don't really do this. Because in this case, one dimensional shrinkage, the polymerization shrinkage, the composites all shrink, basically competes minimally with the dentin bonding. But most of us are filling holes. And with 3D patterns, basically what happens is that the polymerization shrinkage competes with the bond strength. So you might get very little or no bond strength when you think you're getting a lot because the way the composite shrinks. For example, this is the 1D shrinkage, about 10 megapascals. The actual bond strength is 15 megapascals with the product you bought. will bond that much, which means you really only get you know, five when you're bonding an ortho bracket. 3D shrinkage is 35. It's you know, more than double the actual bond strength. And the tensile strength's up there. So in many of these cases, you're not getting any bonding at all in a 3D situation if you do a bulk fill. And there's a lot of questions coming from that, which I can answer later. So this is what happens. The bonding agent can't compete. And so you get, it basically unzips. It doesn't unzip everywhere, but there are little openings everywhere around the corners where the bonding agent gave way. And that's, that's an issue. So normal benton, again, has a smear layer. You can see it here, the way it's all set up. It's kind of attached. And then the first generation of materials, the early Scotch bonds, would stick to that. But there are lots of problems because that was not a consistent surface. And the bond strengths are relatively low, much lower than polymerization shrinkage. Then the second generation was like Gluma, Scotch bond two, where you remove the smear layer and you stick into the tubules. Uh, the problem is, is that intercellular fluid could come up and the bond would weaken over time because there wasn't much keeping it in with the water pushing the hydrophobic resin up from the bottom. The third generation is one we use now. It's called Total Etch. Most of your products you're using are Total Etch, which means you etch the surface in order to get more tertiary relief in the outer surface to, to hold it down. And the idea is you saturate this hybrid zone or this smear layer, which is etched, to form what's called a hybrid zone 
to get some entanglement to make it work better. So this shows you your typical surface. You add the acid, and that's your hybrid zone. Now that's a very delicate thing to keep in the tooth in order to get the proper um, bond strength. So that's important to keep in mind. So what happens is that the tubules get wider, so you can get more fluid coming in. And the deeper you are, the more trouble you get. And the inner, den inner tubular dentin is, is ideally uh, where you're getting most of your bonding. So this is how it works. Acid goes on, you get the hybrid, you get the, the protein sticking out. And then the bonding agent goes on, which wets it and goes into it a little bit, and the composite goes on top. Looks really simple, but sometimes very hard to do. So this shows you the EM of that. You can see in the lower right, you know, the, the way they're interacted. Now, the wetness is fairly important. So one of the areas where most people have trouble with the bent and bonding failures, they don't understand that when you're going to loose two things together, you usually want, usually want to dry, uh, attach something to a dry surface. That's kind of you know, intuitive to most people. But with dentin, it doesn't work that way. When you dry the surface, the protein collapses, and you have really nothing much to bond to. So the bond strength drops over 50% when you just dry the tooth. That's the problem. So here you are, you're etching the tooth, you're drying it off to get rid of the water, and as you're drying it, the protein's collapsing. Not good. Now, if that happens, not the end of the world, you can actually be hydrated. You can just wet the tooth again for 30 seconds, it takes a while, and then the protein will come up to the surface. So the question is, how do you bond to that? Really simple, you need to bond to a moist surface. So this shows you three seconds, 30, and this shows you the EMs of the surface. There it is right there. You know, you dry it for three seconds and there's nothing there. You, you wet it for 30 and it looks pretty good. So moist dentin is, is, is critical. And how to make it moist, you know, well you could, the simplest way is what a cotton pellet takes off is the right amount you should have. Uh, if you know what that looks like, you might be able to handle that with an airway syringe, but you need to really be careful. When in doubt, leave more water. And this shows you to be wetting times here. And you want to, you know, 30 is the magic bullet. 30, the two types of acetone and uh, alcohol-based material. You can see at 30 seconds is pretty much where you get it back. So. There's some real concerns about the bonding agent, uh, and let me talk a little bit about that. So the trouble is, you have a very small window to work. Once you go ahead and you put on the dentin bonding agent, because it is hydrophilic, uh, the pressure is still coming up from the tubules. So you need to kind of get the composite on there soon. So you etch, you put your primer on, uh, you blow, you know, you blow off the excess till it's bone dry. We'll talk about that. The primer is supposed to be dry, but not the dentin. And when the primer is dry, it takes the excess water with it. And then, if you have two-step material, you put the adhesive on that, blow that dry, really dry, and then cure it. And then you need to put the composite on immediately, because if you don't, what happens is the water keeps coming up from the surface, and you get water blisters. And this research is more recent, and it shows that the bond strength can vary enormously. So in other words, what happens after a matter of a few minutes is you get water bubbling through the bonding agent. So when you put your hydrophobic composite on, it doesn't want to stick. So it's a real problem. So the secret is you've got to do one tooth at a time. So if you're doing five composites, and many dentists do, they etch them all at once, put the bonding agent all at once, do it all together. The trouble is, when you fill the first composite, you're going to be pretty good. When you get to the last one, it's too late, and you're going to lose the bond on that considerably. Uh, and so the question is, you really have to do one tooth at a time when you're working. Important. And this shows you the little black spots. It shows you the amount of water. It's really a problem uh, sticking through all the materials. And the self edges have the least because they retain the smear layer. Um, which you know is a little bit of a barrier. So you gotta move quickly to keep this under wraps. The one component materials like solo bond plus, you know, you gotta move quickly or the water will be all over the place. Same with universal bond. So the fourth generation is a unique system where you try to work with the smear layer. So you don't etch the tooth. Instead, you let 
the bonding agent etched the tooth. So you put the bonding agent on the tooth and you rub it back and forth. And while you're rubbing it back and forth, it impregnates the surface, removes the excess smear layer, keeps some of the smear layer, which is partly attached, and you're bonding into that. And that's fourth generation products. They're called the self-etching materials. So this is how you do it. You can etch the enamel, which I highly recommend. Only the enamel, not the dent. Then you basically uh, remove excess water. Cotton pellets best, but you know, keep it moist. Then you apply it, this is the problem, for 15 to 30 seconds, that's a long time. So the average dentist to rub that primer back and forth for a little, at least 15, longer is better, um, is essential. If you don't do that, the dentist's not etched, the smear layer is not saturated, and you basically get nothing. So that's important. So some people put it on and blow it off. They actually put it on and they blow it right off, thinking that's gonna work. That works fine for a third generation bonding agent. But a fourth generation, that's a disaster. You get nothing, just nothing. And you spend $200 for this little bottle, it's messing everything up. So it's very important you understand the application is unique for the fourth generation. Very, very different than the third, which I'll spend more time on. Then you gently uh, blow off all the solvent until you see this very clear plastic coating. With every bonding agent you use, before you put it on a composite, you should see a, a clear plastic coating as if it's, it's wrapped in saran wrap or Tupperware. It's got to be, you can't see any dry spots. It's got to have resin all over it. And then if you don't get it, you repeat it. So you got to really basically uh, see the gloss. And then you like it for at least 10 seconds. More is better. And then you apply your restorative material. Pretty much it. Now the problem is it works for dentin. If you do everything just right. It takes a while. But it doesn't work that well for enamel. So this is Phosphoric, unetched enamel, and etched enamel with phosphoric acid. That's pretty good for tertiary. But with the self etching materials, the bond to enamel is very minimal. So even though you're supposed to use these on the dentin and enamel, self etch on everywhere, the most, the, the, the most common failure I have seen uh, coming into my office is a whole mouthful of posterior composites, and every enamel margin is leaking. It's brown. It's deep yellow, and I can get my Explorer in it. That's someone who put on a fourth generation bonding agent and blew it off and started filling. That's the only way you can get that bad of a dentin bonding agent, like next to zero. So, because the composite shrinks, it's already open when they left the office. So the key to that is that, you know, you can use the fourth generation bonding agents, if, you know, the self etches, if you want to reduce dentin sensitivity which is useful, but you gotta etch the enamel. You just gotta etch the enamel. It's, you just, you just, if you don't etch the enamel separately for 20 seconds, you're taking a big risk. So that you etch for 20, rinse it off without putting the etching on the dentin. Then you do this on the dentin. Now, keep in mind, where are the most sensitive teeth in dentistry? The most sensitive teeth in dentistry are the lowest tooth in the arch on the occlusal. So, Young patients, occlusals on second molars, first time placement in their 20s. That's the highest rate of sensitivity. Those people, you want to do whatever you can. I put a liner in those, first time restoration. The second would be the first, first molar when coming forward. The lower molars have the most sensitivity when you're putting in initial composites. You really got to watch it. And if you're going to do anything there, you could use the third generations there, and that's the enamel on the outside. Uh, those are the cases you want to put in a glass on or a liner, um, especially if the restoration is deep. Uh, save you a lot of grief. So self-etching primers. Okay, let me go. You want to, they retain the smear layer. They have reduced sensitivity. Um, similar bond strengths to dentin, but not enamel. Uh, best use on prepared teeth. Always prepared teeth. Uh, better uh, bond to dentin than enamel. I recommend that you acid etch. Let's talk about single component systems. They need only one solution. However, normally you should use them twice. These are like, you know, the new Scotch Bond um, multi-purpose, or the Scotch Bond, the, 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 yeah, the Scotch Bond Plus, the one bottle one, and the Solo, things like that. Um, they're volatile, so you gotta make sure they're, they're kept sealed. 
Uh, the evaporation occurs as they thicken, so you got to put the top right back on. You never leave, you never dispense it early and let it sit on the counter. Then by the time you use it, 20 minutes later, it's toast. Uh, the acetone base must be applied. Uh, you got to be really careful not to apply them to a tooth that is not wet, and they can desiccate postoperatively. That's where you get the most pain. So usually single use dentin bonding agents, acetone base, lower second molar, young patient, occlusal, that's when you get incredible amounts of sensitivity. And they can go on for a year. And cutting the restoration out may not do much for you. So this is a, a very important slide. It talks about your job in working with a one-step material. This is transition. So in a one-step material, when you buy it and it's not, been des it's not been dried out on the counter, when it's right in the bottle, what you have is a resin floating in a huge amount of solvent. And then you put that on the tooth. And then as you blow it dry, it takes off the excess water, and then the resin starts to concentrate into the tooth. Because when you're done, you want to have just resin on the surface, like a plastic coating on the dentin. So what you're doing is putting the material on and converting it from a solvent to a unfilled resin. And you need to do that conversion every single time. When you're done, you might have little spots in there that aren't fully shiny with resin. Then you've got to add more and go back. So what you're doing is taking something which is going to penetrate dentin and convert it to something which is going to stick to the composite. So it's primer-like, high solvent, and it goes to adhesive-like, no solvent. If you put this on the tooth right away, you can no, almost no bond. So it's very important you use material start out very fluid. Now, if your bottle's old or you left the top off, you're going to start out with this material in the middle or this material. It's not going to work very well. So it's very important you understand that you're doing a conversion process right on the tooth. Now, another thing, just a quick note. If you're using paste-paste systems to do a buildup, you mix A and B and mix it, they're not compatible with, with dentin bonding agents unless you use an activator, and it's a lot of trouble. Uh, so to do that, uh, they're not going to stick. So you need to put an activator in the middle to do that, or the bonding agent's not going to, the buildup's not going to stick to the tooth. Because of that, I use all light cured composites to do my com crown buildups. I don't use the auto cured materials you're mixing A and B together because they're not going to stick to the dentin bonding agent unless you get a separate dentin bonding agent that comes with the kit, not all the kids have it, uh, and um, stick those together. So just a, a thumb up for people that are doing that. So let's take a look at the products in the market today. It's complicated. So let me kind of give you the best understanding I can. So let's talk about this first column. You etch the tooth, you put on a primer, and then you put on a bonding agent. It's a three-bottle system. These are the most reliable systems that have been around the longest. They're all bond two, scotch multi multipurpose, optibond, and clear fill. What you're doing here is you're breaking the bonding system into steps. Um, and you're let, making each step do less, so you're more likable to get it. So that's basically these products, and I'll give you more names later. The second class is going to be where you mix the primer with the bonding agent. So you basically have the primer and bonding agent added together. It's a two-bottle system. You etch, then you put on this one bottle, and that's the conversion one I just told you about. You're converting from an alcohol-based solvent on the tooth to a adhesive layer, which is oily and will polymerize. So that's these products. One step, scotch bond two, multi -point. A lot of people use these. It's fine, as long as you understand what you're doing. The self-etch systems, there's two of those. One, two bottle, where you self-etch and then you put a bonding agent on. Scotch bond two, clearfill, adhesive. These materials you put on the first liquid, which has a primer, and the primer does the etching of the enamel and dentin, which doesn't work well on the, dentin, on the enamel, it does on the dentin. And then you basically go ahead and put a, a second bottle of adhesive over that. You can use those. And then the, the one bottle, which is the most critically sensitive, is the one bottle system. That one bottle is everything. It etches, it primes, it bonds, it does it all. And when it works, it's great. But if it doesn't work, it's disastrous. And these are some of the products here. These products here, which are self-etched, which there's an acid in the liquid, are highly unstable. They break down. 
acids in polymers don't store well. They got to be kept in the refrigerator, and in the refrigerator they last about a year, and you got to constantly check the expiration date because they'll go bad before you know it. In my office, a year is not a long time, and you can easily have a, a box sitting there, and you pull it out, and it's already expired. The advantage of the the second area here, these two areas, is that these materials are, since you, the etching is separated from the product, they have much longer shelf lives. And you're less likely to have a problem putting on a product that's not working. And they're more forgiving. So as we go from left to right, we go most forgiving, medium forgiving, not too forgiving, and minimally forgiving. So you really want to keep that in mind. So these are some of the products. Why are there so many? It's really simple. The bottle that the product comes in costs probably under a dollar, most likely 30, 40 cents. The component in the bottle usually costs less than a dollar, if that much, because they contain water, alcohol, and a couple polymers. The bottle sells for over $200. So these products have what you call a very high margin. For every $100 you spend on this product, for every $200, they got maybe $2 in product. The boxing costs much more than the product. And their biggest expense is marketing. Most of what they spend is trying to sell it to you. That's why when you go through the journals, most of the ads that are really expensive to run are for bonding agent, because that's where the money is. Because for every $200 you give them, they get to keep 190 or 195 It's a pretty good deal. Um, the problem is it may be worth it $200 to you, and the price that they charge is what they determine that we will pay. So we happen to feel that 200 bucks is what it should cost to glue our fillings in. So that's what they charge. That's what the market will bear. And so you should understand that that's why there's so many of them. So, uh, the question is, which one should you pick? And I'll go into that. So the other thing to realize is a lot of these are unstable. You need to shake them. Almost all the bottles have something that will separate out, particularly over the weekend. So before you do anything with a bottle, you shake it back and forth, maybe for 20 seconds. If you don't do that, you could be losing the filler that's in the, mid in the bottle. And that is a, a very important component for many of the systems to prevent, increase their strength. Fillers at the bottom, gotta shake it. So there are two types of composites on the market, alcohol-based and ethanol-based. The acetone-based are much more clinically sensitive and give more sensitivity. So if you're gonna choose a product, I would recommend ethanol-based. Now, another thing which is really important that we know a lot about, but most dentists aren't aware about, is called MMPs. These are matrix proteinases. In other words, in the tissues, there are proteins produced by bacteria that dissolve the bond. A real problem. It occurs with enamel and dentin, but more profoundly with the dentin. Um, so these are things you need to worry about. And these proteases kind of result in your bonding starting to fail right after it leaves the gate. And so we'd like to reduce that. So there are products that will reduce initially those bacteria from making those proteases. So the bacteria are doing that to make food. They're trying to break this thing down so they can eat the protein that your bonding agent is sticking to. So the first one is Hema Solutions uh, with sodium um, fluoride called AquaPrep. You put this in the prep right after you finish etching before you put the bonding agent on. And this supposedly will, in laboratory studies, they're all lab studies, will make the bond last longer when they cycle it with bacteria. The other one is chlorhexidine. Uh, Concepsis is one of them, which you put on the prep. A lot of people put that. Now, people say it reduces sensitivity. That's not well understood. It does increase bond strength over time in a laboratory. Don't know if it does much for sensitivity. And then glutaraldehyde solutions uh, can be used. Uh, and you basically etch it. Once it's etched, you put the glutaraldehyde on. You then dry that off and then proceed with your bonding procedures. And there's lots of products in the market that are glutaraldehyde. Uh, these, you know, they're, they, they're pretty pricey. Uh, and you can use any one of them. I make my own. You can buy 25% glutaraldehyde from a chemical supply. It costs like 25 bucks. And, it's come, and you can, from that, uh, make 
one bottle of that it comes in a pint is probably enough for 10 years worth of material. The cost of each bottle will cost you less than the bottle, maybe 10, 15 cents. The key is you have to keep it sealed and it's sensitive to light, uh, which is important. And um, you can easily tell when it's not working because you put it on the tooth. When it's sensitive. We, we put it, if someone comes with a sensitive tooth, we put this glutaraldehyde 5% right on the tooth, right when they're there. When it hurts the air, when I start, I put the glutaraldehyde on. 15 seconds, blow it off, put the air on again, it doesn't hurt. Immediately they have relief. I know it's active. If it doesn't, don't get immediately relief right away, then basically I know the HEMA in the bottle I made up myself is not good. And it is sensitive to contaminants. A typical bottle lasts three to six months if you have a clean bottle. So again, back to MMPs. The next thing you can use is chlorhexidine. There's a mechanism here. Um, and uh, you can use it. Normally how you do that is you put the chlorhexidine, uh, once you etch, you put the chlorhexidine on a cotton pellet, put the cotton pellet in the prep, let it sit there. Uh, you know, it varies. Some people say 20 seconds, some say two minutes, but you know, at least 20 seconds. And then you blot it dry, and then you proceed with your bonding. The evidence basically shows that you need to have at least 2% chlorhexidine to work, and for that you need to buy the materials. The ones that you use your office with hygiene are, are much lower concentrations than that. They're like 0.1 and you need 2%, so you will need to buy that. Okay, now, basically, some products basically uh, are using um, antibacterials, and we'll talk a little bit about those. So there is one uh, company that has a patent on basically MDPB, P P B, MDPB. Basically, it's your mol it's the it's the MDP that's been used for years to stick the metals in the Curare products. They added a bromide to it. Very clever, and they got studies to show it to work. What the bromide does is make the bonding surface bactericidal or bacteriostatic at least. So the bacteria can't grow at the interface at the hybrid zone to break off the protein from the resin where your bond is. And this is patented, so for right now, it's only on a few products. So you take this off, and you've got your standard, uh, with a, put a phosphate there, and that's your, your typical bonding material that you, that you use. So this shows you uh, self-etched materials, um, and basically, uh, you can clearly see that um, it helps. So uh, the laboratory shows that if you look at a laboratory and you're doing the tests, that the, the initially, when the studies were done, that shows that the amount of bacteria growing in that surface uh, compared to the other treatments is, is quite good. So it's a highly technique sensitive matter. Now the question is, who did the bonding? So this shows you a very good study, and it shows you that the bonding can vary from as much as 30 MPA, you know, 35 for a, a dental, for a dentist researcher, down to 30 for a lab tech. A new lab tech, you just hired maybe 20. But the average practicing dentist, when they're had to, to do these lab studies in the lab, they come and do it like you do in the office, they're getting like seven, maybe eight MPA. So they're getting a fraction of the bond. So the average dentist does not get very good bond strengths out of most dental bonding agents because they're technique sensitive and many of them aren't sensitive to uh, how carefully you need to be. So let's look at some of the information here. This is a five-year plus failure. This is generally what you see, and that is MMPs breaking down the margin, as well as thermal coefficient expansion. So hard to know what at first. Probably MMPs start first, then the coefficient expansion starts second, and the bacteria get in for there. But pretty much dentin bonding agents uh, hang in there, you know, up to five plus years without the uh, other materials there. The bonds weaken over time immediately when they're put in. And so the idea is to get that to be better. So the other issue is thermal, co co thermal, thermal coefficient of expansion. It's four times greater on resins than on glass ionomers. Here it is right here. <coughs> Notice the glass ionomer, the thermal coefficient of expansion, is 10 to 11, almost the same as tooth, which is 11. Composite, it's 20 to 60. So every time you have hot and cold, uh, basically, the bond gets cycled out. Not good. So basically, 
uh, you should consider when you're working in places that aren't very aesthetic is to use glaciolimers if you want something that's going to be there a long time. Glaciolimers uh, generally don't break down at the edges from thermal coefficient uh, cycling um, over any period of time. They'll discolor the stains coming in, which are um, basically uh, water soluble. But if you've got root carriers or something like that, it's pretty hard to beat them. So improving bond strength. Let's go over the ways you can improve bond strengths. One, always roughen the surface. You want a fresh cut surface, and you want it to be roughed. Generally, with the diamond, you'd use the first start prepping your tooth. You know, the one where you can see the diamond go around. You want it as rough as possible. Plus, the mechanical roughness helps uh, take the the um, polymerization shrinkage and it diffuses the stresses. So rough surfaces are very important on dentin for bonding. Less so on enamel, but it helps enamel too. And then you want to etch the dentin for probably 10, 15 seconds. You want to rub the primer always onto the surface. You want to let it soak into the hybrid layer for the appropriate length of time. Uh, if you're doing a, a type four, it's, you know, it's 15 seconds at least. And then you want to dry the excess solvent out Place the adhesive till shiny, like here for 10 seconds. And then your first layer of composite, you want to ramp. What does that mean? I didn't talk about, uh, maybe another day we can talk about polymerization. But when you put your first composite in at the bottom of the box, turn the curing light on when it's an inch above the tooth, and then slowly bring it down. That prevents the shock of the composite shrinking and usually results in a little better seal. And there are a lot of studies that show that is helpful for the first layer only. Uh, the safest bonding materials in dentistry are these. The Cure family, Clearful SE Bond, the others like that. They, the present ones on the market all have the bromide in those. So those are definitely uh, the safest. Um, they come as a total edge tech, as a total edge technique, depending how you want to use them, or you can use them as a, as initially the instructions have a self edge technique for the dentin portion. The second would be the Scotch Bond brand. I do the Scotch Bond two multi purpose, the two bottle system. Then the Optibond, the two bottle system, and the Albon two two bottles. Those are the safest in terms of the you know the less things can go wrong. So let's look at some of the studies. This is uh, a study of, uh, over time, um, retentive rates. And you can see the glass timer is pretty darn good. Uh, this is uh, Curare. Uh, some of these studies were funded by them. But you can basically get a feel for that. You get a little more when you don't have the, uh, the bacteria involved in the bromide. So you know it's a, it's a bit higher. They're all up there, but you get more, um, you get more with the bromide in there. And then this shows you different retentive rates. These are funded by the manufacturer, but they're still impressive. Even if they're funded by the manufacturer, people who are researchers usually don't fudge that much. But basically, a 96 uh, retention rate over 10 years, that's, that's pretty impressive. But it, it's, they do quite well. These are done by researchers, so you know, it's going to be triple the bond strength you get doing it in a dental office. Shows you some of the clinicals. And they, they do 13-year recall. I mean, let's face it, that's pretty darn good done by people who are being very careful. And any dentist can be very careful if they want to in their practice. But they first have to know how to be careful, and then take the extra time to be careful, and then make sure that you know they, their fee structure allows them to be careful. And this shows you some of the others here. This one is done by independent laboratory studies. And it shows they're all pretty good. You know, this one did this, you know, the MBD one always comes up a little higher, but basically, you know, these are gives you good numbers, but this, the products I mentioned are doing well on here. Any questions on dentin bonding? If somebody wants to send those in, I'll answer them. I got one. Great. Okay. All right. So I'm glad bleaching was really easy to understand. No one had any questions on that. Was great. Okay. So the question is. How does a patient clean their mouth after wearing bleach trays overnight? Okay, great. So after uh, wearing bleach trays overnight, the patient ideally should just rinse with water. Uh, but nice thing about overnight is that the, to the, the, the time of the tooth to remineralize is usually fine. So um, if you wear them overnight, by the bleach is gone. Let's say they go to bed at 10 o'clock. The bleach is pretty much gone by 11. 
and then between 11 and the morning, the saliva has gone through there and it's already remineralized the tooth. So in the morning, they can just brush their teeth as normal if they want. They don't have to brush at all, but if they want to, they can brush their teeth. There won't be, there'll be plaque on the teeth, but not much. Uh, but I usually have people brush in the morning with a dry toothbrush. I don't have them use toothpaste um, just because it's a little less abrasive. And then um, at night, brush with the toothpaste and go from there. That's the question on overnight uh, wearing. Um, if there's any questions on the um, uh, bonding agents, as I'm going through the next lecture on the um, composites, we should be good. We have a half hour left, so I'll go through part of this one, or maybe a little longer, it depends on the time it is. Um, and I have, this is in multiple sections, so I can stop really any time. But um, this is just my hallmark, what I've been famous for the last 43 years is basically um, direct restoratives, you know, bonding. I, you know, I got beautiful pictures of how to do bonding and have it last a long time and, um, you know, re full mouth reconstructions. And basically most of my uh, career has been running a, uh, basically uh, a 36-day, three-year study club. I did that for like 30 years at the University of Washington, University of Oregon, UCSF, and UOP. And many of the people in this, some of the people listening probably have taken that class. Uh, it was basically 12 sessions for three years. And it was basically starting with the most basics and going all the way up to doing full mouth reconstructions. We did a lot of them, and the patients were actually brought to the school. And um, so, uh, how to use restoratives, how to use composite, porcelain, metal, and all that stuff is sort of my hallmark. And so, this is going to be a, a reduced version of reduced version of how to get the most out of that. So let's talk about restorative dentistry a little bit, composite materials. So the most important thing is I want to make things as simple as possible, but not simpler. And I've seen so many lectures in the world, I attend as many as I can, that things are just too simple. And I think, you, know, you follow those rules, you're going to, you know, it's like saying to a car, how do you drive a car? You step on the gas, it goes, and you step on the brake, it stops. It just isn't that way. There's a lot more to it. So I'm hoping to make things as simple as I possible in this lecture, but give you enough information so you're not going to have failures or minimal failures or not failures that you could control. And that's sort of my, my hallmark. So I'm going to go through these sections here, and I think um, some of you will find it useful. So again, almost all this is in the book. Um, the classifications have not changed in 25 years, but the products have been changing in in other words, each classification has new products added to it. And many of the old products have been reintroduced twice with different names. You know, so the product hasn't changed, but they just you know, tweaked it 2% and just put a new name on it, remarket it, because dentists want to buy new things. At least that's what I'm told from the marketing people. Anytime it says new on it, their sales double. So hopefully new is not necessarily the way to go. Okay, so let's talk about resin types. Um, basically, all composites basically have resins that Cross-link. So basically, you have a a, um, a piece of acrylic with a double bond on each end, and you can cross-link those. And the cross-linking on those basically um, results in uh, more strength because you had a fishnet rather than a chain. And you also have um, the larger you, the chains you put in there, the less shrinkage you are in the overall mass. So this shows you typical cross-linking here, as opposed to um, acrylic, which is just straight lines. So that kind of gives it to you there. So basically, um, presently, except for one product from 3M, which is marketed separately, all of the um, products are, um, wow, this is on auto, I didn't see that. Okay, all of the products are um, interchangeable. So we can do what we want with them. So one of the issues that's come up a lot is bisphenol A. I've had patients come into my office saying, you can do anything you want to fix the teeth with my little girl, but you can't use any composite. Because they say, you know, you'll, you'll hurt my daughter. Because they all have bisphenol, bisphenol A in it, which is not really true. So bisphenol A um, is a breakdown product, which can break down a little bit in some composite resins. And estrogen uh, basically uh, has a similar component on one of the molecules. That's what's called a phenol group. 
And there is a lot of concern uh, from people uh, thinking that the composites are dangerous because they're going to reduce, they're going to uh, make large amounts of basically uh, mess up your system as they're going to release estrogen into your body, which isn't really true. This is this GMA here and this, and this EMA, two of the most commonly used ones, would have the product on. There's no prox, there's no phenol group in these molecules. None of them have a phenol group. But they say, well, when it breaks down, it might form one. Yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe this will break into here, and maybe, you know, it's possible that, um, let's see if I can get this to, okay, maybe it's possible, but, but highly unlikely. Um, so basically, the amount of BIS-GMA on the worst composite um, that can be reduced in the worst situation, uh, when they've calculated out, would be less than 0.1% of the daily intake of the average person. So the FDA has done studies, and they basically say that, you know, um, the intake of the average American is basically X amount. And when you push everything to get the worst result with composite, and they're not cured right, so most, you know, composite with the most phenol in them, or phenol-like materials in them, uh, it's under a tenth of one percent. So that's pretty much, and that's daily dose. And so at this point, it's non-issue, but I still get people coming in not wanting composites in their, in their teeth. So composites have a resin, and what makes them strong is they're filled with a filler. The filler is usually glass. It's usually a clear glass. Um, and the advantage of glass, it's good stiffness. Disadvantage, it's basically um, less polishable. And there's um, more wear resistance and high vitality. Glass makes the resin look like tooth. So it's good. And when you polish it, the trouble is it gets rough. And over time, what happens is you get wear. So glass is the way to go. And over the years, they've been working with that. And what they've done mostly is made the particles smaller. Now, when you make them smaller, that's good for the polish and the wear. But it usually results in them being weaker because there's overall less amount of stiffness in the material. And they flex more. So what people have done over time is trying to work with varying amounts of filler of different sizes. And they've been called hybrids. So most composites on the market now are hybrids. But they're not all equal hybrids. They're all different types of hybrids. Hybrids with very large particles in them uh, have very different properties than hybrids with small particles in them. And I'll try to go over that as, as we go through. So the mini-fill products are the ones that have fillers in the middle, um, usually 5 microns. They've been around a long time. The TPH, Tetric, Aesthetics, P60, et cetera. And these look satin when you polish them. And they're relatively strong. And they've been used for a long, long time. Uh, but you know, if you have a coffee or tea drinker, they will pick up stain. So then they've made the particles even smaller. And we've called these submicron fillers. In other words, the fillers are under a micron. Uh, usually between 1 micron and 0.5. Now, 0.5 is a magical number because that's the size of the crystals inside the enamel uh, rods. So when you make a product with 0.5 particles in it, it looks really good. It looks just like enamel. And the closer you get to that, the better it looks. So when these came out, people really liked them. These are products like Herculite, Charisma, Prodigy, Brilliant Synergy, 0.4. These are just still today are highly used because they have enormous aesthetics. And they have reasonable strength. Uh, so they can be used where the loading is, is, is not excessive. And uh, they're still being used. Now, a microfiller, a mini filler, looks like this when you fill it. So normally what I do is put a little composite at the edge, curious what it looks like. But you, know, you can do most of your threes and your fours and your fives. Uh, not your fours as much, but definitely um, most restorations that aren't really large um, in this type of material. Now, microfillers are a little bit different. And there used to be microfillers and macrofillers are big different classes. Now they're all mixed. I'm trying to explain that to you. Microfiller is a very, very small particle. It's less than the wave. You can't see it. It's 0.04 micron. So this is a typical 10 micron filler. So it's, 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 it's that. And it's very, very fine material. It's basically the ash 
that remains uh, when you burn something. So if you look in your fireplace, that ash that's down there, you put that through your fingers, that's pretty much microfiller. And it's used all over. It's used in toothpaste, it's used to make paints thicker, it's used in food. Uh, it's basically put in most products to stop things from settling. So when you buy some in the store, you don't have to shake it. Usually there's microfiller in there because it prevents stuff from settling out. So microfiller is used a lot and it's very, very small. And it's so small that basically the composite looks really polished. So there's microfiller and there is nanofiller. So basically how they work with these small particles, they usually mix them into blocks and, um, and grind them, or they can grow them from a nuclei, or they can fuse little pieces into bigger pieces, or they make clusters. And I'll show you all these, because each one of these has a different product with different properties, and you need to kind of know what they will. So the, your classical microfiller, which is like your Durafil, and a lot of products like that, and like Renamel and things like that in the market, uh, they have very unique properties. Uh, they're basically made by making composite blocks of heavy amounts of filler and heat and grinding those down and putting them into more composite. These materials, if you put them on a class 5 surface, um, they'll look good 20 years from now. I mean, a Mopper has got studies, and I've got some slide, I pick cases too, where I put a microfiller coating on a surface, and you know, 10 years, 12 years, 15 years later, it looks like I put it in yesterday. So these materials do remarkable well. If there's absolutely no stress, and they're not too large. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So, uh, what they do with these, these teeny microfillers, there's the block. It's huge. It's like 60 microns. You can see the block. You feel, if you take some of this composite and you mix it with alcohol and you rub it in your fingers, you can feel them. You can feel them. Isopass, Durafil, enamel, and now there's quite a few uh, products being reintroduced with new names of the same stuff. So the advantage of these is if you polish them, they stay polished and uh, as compared to the macrofillers. The benefits of them, the matrix is the same, so you have the same composition. They retain a very smooth surface indefinitely. They resist staining. They won't stain at all. Uh, it's pretty much zero. Um, they're immune to acids. It's a big deal. Uh, and surface erosion. So if people have a lot of acid in their diet, these will not pit out like glass fillers will. Um, very important. The problems with them is that they basically have a higher coefficient of thermal expansion, so if they're large, they tend to chip. Lower stiffness, a little higher water absorption, even the new ones are quite good. A little more shrinkage, not a lot more, a little more, but they tend to break in long periods of time if they're under stress. So you don't want to do class fours of them. They're great um, when they're not stressed. So you shouldn't be used in twos, threes, or sixes because most of these are radiolucent. And the last thing I want to see in a patient is a radiolucent class three. The microfiller is basically a, a good polish, but they're weaker. And, um, but there's use for them. And I'll talk about how they've changed. What they've done now is they've taken that little particle and they've just fused it into larger pieces or complexes. And there's a whole new set of products out there. And so we'll try to give you a feeling for that. One of the very good ones is helium molar. Helium molar is now what I use for veneers. It's basically if you want to put something on the outside of a tooth, you put a little coating on it, helium molar flow particularly, you put that on the surface of a composite and it's going to be there for a very long time without showing any signs of uh, staining. Uh, you can use complexes like in Filtech. Uh, Filtech is the largest selling composite in the world and it's made of complexes. It's a microfiller just glued together in big pieces. And then there's particle uh, use of, in, in condensation. There's a lot of uh, of these particles that are mixed in with everything else. And we'll kind of go over those and give you a feel for them. Many particles now are grown through nuclei. They basically put um, a, a, a mixture in there and they keep saturating the solution and particles come out of it. This is how the 3M products are made with zirconia. So they have a patented filler and this is what they use. They actually nucleate it and they grow their own particles to the sizes that they want. So this shows you different sizes. So this is a mini field product, 0.6. That's Herculite. That's the, this is the size of the crystals in the enamel surface. 0.4 is a little less. And there's Filtech at 75 nanometers. And then 20 nanometers, which is typically used, uh, shows you uh, that size in comparison. So in comparison, a soccer ball is to the Earth the same ratio as a nanofiller is to a soccer ball give you a feeling of the smallness of these. And they are made into clusters. 
and you can look at them in EM and you can see the clusters, the particles are unlike this, you can see they're glued together. Some of the people uh, glue them in balls, some of them kind of get them close and form uh, irregular clusters. The reason these are so popular is you can get good properties. The nanofillers allow you to make the composite clearer and therefore more vital looking, particularly for an enamel color. So this shows you hybrid, the light comes through, microfiller. So this is really, in my case, only really useful if I'm working on an incisal edge in a young patient. Generally, the hybrid uh, clearness is fine, but this shows you the power to mix and blend and get what you want. So let's talk about loading now. So usually you take both large and small particles and mix them together. So almost all composites are hybrids. It's just how you mix them that makes a difference. And this is interesting. It shows you all these composites with the similar loading. However, they look the same, whoops, but um, this one is half stronger. How can that be? The filler loading is related to the strength. Well, this one's half stronger. It's really simple. This one's got big, big filler in it. So if you add big particles to the composite, you give up a little bit on polish, maybe a lot on polish, but you can double the strength and put it in places where it will last indefinitely as opposed to where it will break off, like a class four. And so the more larger particles, the more stronger it becomes. This shows you the amount of filler, and it shows you the, the various strengths. So if you look at just the particle itself, more filler is also stronger. So more filler, smaller filler is good. Add some big filler to it, and you got more strength. They show you different distributions of the different products you're going to use, E250 and all the Z products, 0.4 and Vitalessence, which is uh, another mini fill. So strong, stronger, strongest. The difference with Sheriff Sterifil, it's got big particles. It is really strong. You can make a crown out of this stuff. It won't be very pretty in terms of the polish, but it'll probably last a decade. It's very strong. Uh, so if you give up prettiness, and a patient can't afford a crown, you can put something in there that's going to be there a very long time. Yes, the proximal will wear. Yes, the occlusal will wear. But you can put a crown on in the future rather than losing the tooth you know, right away. So let's talk about flow versus packables. Very important. As you make something more flowable, you drop the filler substantially. So if you drop the filler only, one or two percent, which isn't a lot, basically the material becomes very, very fluid. But what happens as you come down this, this is the stiffness related to the strength, that the flowable materials, even though they have only 10 percent less filler, they have 60 rather than 75 or 70, they are usually half as strong. And so you got to be really careful using uh, flowables because if you put them anywhere with their strength, like in a box, uh, in bulk, you're going to have problems. So basically, a flowable is less viscous composite with less filler. And when they first came out, uh, they said they're revolutionary. I, I had people basically fill MODs with them because it was like you fill a swimming pool with water and cure it. Those didn't go long. Within a year, they all busted out. So advantage of flowable, easy adapts well, easy for coatings. Disadvantage, low strength, high shrinkage, poor color stability, high wear. What I use flowables for is a sealant. I have one flowable, I use it as a sealant. I use it at the bottom of the box in a thin amount to increase adaptation. Uh, you can use it with the cement veneers, because if it's thin, not a problem. And there's all kinds of ways you can do this. Now, flowables are used for repair, cementation, bonding agents. It's a perfect bonding agent if you're bonding the porcelain. If you're bonding the porcelain and metal, you don't want to use a dentin bonding agent. It's full of water, which is great for dentin. What you want to do using metal or porcelain, you want to put the silent on for the porcelain, the metal bonding is the metal, and then you want to put the flowable on and blow it off. It'll be twice as strong if you put a water layer between those two hydrophobic periods. So there's lots of use for them, repairing temporaries, uh, stuff like that. Now, one way to make a flowable, which is the best way, is a flowable is just more fluid. Rather than going ahead and buying one with half the filler, many of the composites you already have restored, if you just heat them up, they'll become a flowable. And in most cases, you can work with that. So basically, there's a little device here. It has different settings on it. And with this device, you, depending on the temperature, you control the amount of fluidity. And most packable composites that are stiff will turn into clear liquid when you get them up to a high temperature. So if you want to improve the adaptability, you can heat the thing up, put it in the box where you're worried about adaptation. And as it cools, you then can pack it. Works really well. 
The only disadvantage of that is that the composite, once it's heated, will have a very short shelf life. So once you heat up the little syringe in there, you throw it away. You don't you save it the next time because you're going to dry it out. The heat makes the, the composite has lots of different solvents in it, and the volatile solvents leave. Not right away, but over a period of time once it's heated. And then you want to basically throw it out. And they, cut, they make them for every single system out there. Um, and this shows you that they cure faster, too. So your curing time, 10 seconds with the curing, is equal to about 40 seconds if it's hot because everything goes quicker. So that's, those are thoughts, too. So you can, you know, if you're in a deep box and you don't, can't get the light way down there because it's 7 millimeters or 8 millimeters away, a warm composite will cure better under, with less light. And this shows you all the difference in temperatures and curing. It varies from material to material, but overall, warmer is better. Sonic fill, some people like that. Uh, it has a, it's a proprietary system, and you can vibrate it down. It works fine. It's the same system as if you put a, you're pouring a model and you put it on a vibrator. I, I don't like using it because uh, I can't have as many composites between it, but um, I've used it a few times. It's fine. And if you like it, I'm okay with that. Packable composite. Now, this is a really something else. Uh, you can core, cool composites and make them thicker, but I highly, I don't recommend that because the, then your curing time goes up, which I don't recommend. Um, so basically, packables are easier to place a matrix pan. That's it. If you've got a good matrix technique, then you don't have to. You never need a packable. Easier to place anatomy, eh, probably. Um, sticks to instruments less, of course. Axial like amalgam, yes. Disadvantage. You can easily create overhangs. The most common overhang is when you're pushing really hard on a matrix band, because uh, that band from sideways, you know, can easily be displaced. Voids are more common at the margins also, because it doesn't wet as well. So some people put a little flowable in first. Dry spots can occur, which is a problem. And of course, there's no improvement in physical properties. And that's, that's a problem. You don't get anything for all that. It's used for posterior composites, buildups, canal spaces, things like that. Things where you want to be able to push, even though I'm not sure I use them for that. There's 19 bulk fill comp composites on the market with absolutely no clinical studies. It's unbelievable. They just took the material, cranked up a little bit, reintroduced it, so you'll have two boxes of composites in your office that can all, you know, get old together. So um, if you have one, fine, but uh, I would tend to use a composite that had a clinical study, which is one which doesn't it was not a, was not a packable. Bulk fill composites are another issue too. I would stay away from those um, because they're not as strong. They make a bulk fill. They actually weaken the material and reduce physical properties substantially, usually 20, 25 percent. And I would rather layer a composite a little bit than put in one in bulk fill and have 20 percent less and have to do it over in the future. So that's just I won't do anything to reduce physical properties. So that's my opinion. Let's talk about selecting material. Um, 80s, people wanted anterior, posterior, 90s, one material. Now, pretty much, we have kind of everything available. This is a very important graph. You've got this down, you got it all. So on this end of the, of the spectrum, there are large particles. On this end, there are small particles. And you need to know how to work through this. So this here is a macrofill, 10 microns. This is a microfill. You can't see it, 0.04. These two are critical numbers. The enamel rods are right around 5, 6 microns in, in size. And the bundles, I mean, sorry, 0.5 microns in size. And the bundles are 4 to 5 microns in size. So basically, you have, this is the prisms. This is your mini fill that looks so good. And this is uh, the particle size of the bundles, which is your initial products like in size. You know, they're all about 5 microns. So the small particles and the mini fill particles are each side of the tooth itself. So if you want strength, go to this end. You know, less polishable, high strong, it's very strong, low thermal expansion. If you want something pretty, you want it to be on this side. And that basically do that. And these, as you go through this, they become more like this end and more like that end. Works really well. So these are some of the product names. You need to have usually something from this end in your office. Ideally, something from this end, and a lot in the middle. <coughs> so basically, let's start at the at the the big end. Alert pyramid, and what everyone wants, sure, Phil. 
These are not very pretty, but they'll give you strength when you need it. Ideal for a buildup. If you're gonna do a crown buildup, that's what you wanna use. I'd use light cured uh, for the crown buildup, not chemically mixed for what I talked about earlier. Um, if you're just doing routine dentistry, these are all the materials that you can use for um, intermediate restorations. Satin finish is what you're gonna use for your, you know, your class threes and your uh, pretty, pretty stuff. Charisma aesthetics is all your point one, point two. These are your mini fills. You know, these are all very typical materials. And right now, you could add 20 names below it. Your, your job is to put it into the list based on its physical properties, and a company will give you those. And then, these are your glomerular microfills, which are in here, which is smooth but stronger. And these are your pure microfills. And the product I tend to use the most is helium molar. It's still polishable enough, so it looks just as polishable as this end, but you have the strength. And it's also radiopaque. It has in it uh, uh, tritium, which is a radiopaque raw earth they stick in it. So I would definitely go with the helium molar. If you're using Durafil, fine. It's great stuff or enamel. Uh, they work fine, too. It's just your choice. And there's quite a few materials now that are in, in that lineup. So if you're going to build a, a building or do anything in construction, Usually you have three things. One is you usually have, let's say you're going to build a house. You're going to you put bricks up first, something stiff. If you have a large material, you want something stiff, compressible, high tensile, less breakage, poor smoothness is okay, less static. You want strength. You want something to hold everything up that you're going to build. Let's say you're going to build a house. Then uh, you'd like to maybe have some contour. The bricks may not be very pretty. So you want to basically get a smooth surface. You want to be able to mold it. You want to be able to hide irregularities. You want to make the, you know, put some contour in. So this is, you know, great for doing contour. This would be your mini filled materials, heavy filled, mini filled. And then when you're all done with having the contour just right, you may want it to look pretty. So then you put a microfilm on top. So that's low stiff, low compressive, but it's very pretty. So most things are made of three layers. If you go back to the time of the Romans, which is quite a while ago. Uh, you'll see images of uh, all three being used. The Romans put bricks in, they put a mortar over that, and they found little picks of pigment found that probably fell off that used to be used on the surface. So this is literally, you know, 3,000 years old or whatever. So that's just the way um, restorations, uh, you get the most out of them. Now, you don't need 55 colors of each of those, and I can talk about that in a second. So some manufacturers do this for you. They make a dentin and they put bigger particles in it, and then enamel is smaller particles, more lucent. And this is more opaque. So they, they, you know, if you grab the tooth, and you grab the dent, and you grab the enamel, they've already tuned this for you, which is very nice. Uh, not, they don't all do that, but many of them do. Now, there are limits. If you're building a building, you can only go up three stories with wood because wood has only so much stiffness. And so the rule with porcelain, if you're doing a bake on porcelain, with either with Emacs or, or even any type of porcelain, generally you, got, you can only go three millimeters off the base because most bake on porcelains won't do well more over three millimeters. And with composites, about the same. If you're going to use a mini field composite, you don't want to have it extend more than three millimeters off of anything. Uh, you want to have something stronger underneath it. And then, you know, ideally less than three, two is optimal. And then if you want to put something on the surface, you can, but that's generally the way to do it. So, you know, you can basically do the whole thing in one material if you want, if you don't mind it not looking too smooth. You can do two materials if you want, which is the most common, uh, where you have something a little smoother over something to give you support. This probably go a little bit lower. And then you have the second area where um, uh, you can do more. So, two shades, one shade, three shades. Um, that's one shade, two shades, three. So what will the patient accept? In my office, and most people do quite well with two shades. If I start getting into something much more exotic, I'm happy to do it. But you, you, know, you want to do what the patient wants. So 5% of the work, I can use you know, all the colors in the world and do something beautiful and charge the patient a, you know, a fee, which would not be on the Delta fee schedule, to make four beautiful composite veneers you know, with all the bells and whistles and the lucency and all that. Um, for in most people, um, they just want a, a reasonable match. And that would be one shade or possibly two, depending on the case. The trouble is when you buy the composites, here I'm going to save you a lot of money, you buy the kit, it's got 20 shades in it. Holy Moses, 30 shades, you know. 
33 shades. So the kit, you end up using the kit and you end up having one tube empty and then everything is kind of not used. And these kits cost thousands of dollars. So mm, the thing to realize is most composites come with the same shade in different opacities. So basically, you have the denton shades, which are usually much more opaque. There's the body shades, enamel, and the sizes. So the average modern composite comes in not only all the shades, <coughs> they come in all the different opacities. So what the hell do you use? You don't want to spend 10 grand on a composite. Some offices do, but I, I don't think you're going to gain that much from it. So the denton will mask the tooth, and this gives you reflective properties of the surrounding areas. Generally, the difference is 20%. So the body is your average color. Your dentin is usually 20% more opaque than the body, and the enamel shade is usually 20% more lucent, and the incisal shade is usually 40% more lucent. So knowing that, you can get some ideas. So the first thing I want to do is save you a whole lot of money. So in my office, we do not buy a composite by the kit. We buy it by the tube. And yes, you get a little, you pay a little bit less if you buy it. 50 tubes or 30 tubes and only a few, but we will tend to you buy what we use. So if you want to get a full kit, there's these guides you can use and they'll actually tell you what shades to use if you want to multi-layer. And they're reasonably accurate. They're not too far off. And you know, if you want to spend the time and put all those colors in, you, you can do that. So in my office, if you want to get the middle market shades, you only buy six tubes. You buy B1, I'm sorry, you buy A1B, A1 body, A2 body, A3 body, and then the enamel the same, A1, A2, A3 enamel. The shade we use most in our office is A2 body because the darker teeth we bleach down. And the lighter tea, if they come in and it's a molar, I know they're going to darken over time. I may go to an A1, but I'm more likely going to stay in a molar tooth closer to an A2. That's where they're going to be. And then in our office, we put the body up to the level of the EJ, and then we put the enamel on top because it looks really good because the enamel is more lucent, and the restoration just disappears. Two shades, you look fine. So that's it. Those are what we use, and that's what we buy. And usually we're reordering the middle ones over and over again. Uh, we occasionally order the A3, maybe once a year. And the B1, we, we order maybe two or three times a year. We're ordering the middle one all the time because those are the colors we use the most because that's, that's the target color for our patients. So from my experience, we get 95% of the match from that. And one exception. If you do a lot of bleaching in your office, huge amount of bleaching, uh, you're going to have a lot of these gray patients turn into C1s and C2s. If you're going to do that, you only really have to buy um, basically the, the C2 or C1 uh, enamel. You don't need the dentin because the body could stay the same. You just put another dentin enamel on it. You might have one tube of that if you're doing a lot of that kind of stuff. <coughs> so here I was going to stop for questions, if there are any. And how's my time? I have, let me see, it's 2.05, so I'm pretty close to used up my time here. I do have more material. I don't know if anybody wants to see it, but I'll let the Reds director make a decision here. That's it. That's it, all right. So we are good. Um, when I come back in the future, I can go over placement, show you how to do all the different things that there are. I've got lectures on curing bonding. I have about 100 lectures. If you have any particular subjects, you can write, email me. There's a good chance I have that, and I can send you an outline of the lecture. It's basically the PowerPoint show. Have email to anybody. And then if the society wants to cover those things, we can kind of go from there. So it's been a wonderful audience. I wish I could see you guys here. I've enjoyed uh, presenting this to you. And uh, you can email me at Harry Albert is my name. Hopefully you won't forget that. At mac.com or me.com, either way. And I'm happy to send you anything I have uh, anytime. So thank you very much. Appreciate it.